and you can take it away. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody today. I see so many friends and a family member, and uh, I'm so glad you could join me today uh, for this segment of Eyes Wide Open, Learning to Look in Order to See. But before we begin, I uh, once again want to thank the friends of the Westport Center for Senior Activities and Holly Betts, Sue Fister, and Jason Wilson for inviting me to share these visual experiences and hopefully provide you with some stimulating images. Um, today, I will share with you uh, a world of visual interest, part two, and uh, what I hope will be another eye-opening experience of what caught my eye and why. Part two will hopefully open your eyes to international range of different images. And today's subject will relate to architecture, wildlife, and yes, botanicals. Uh, this will be, uh, I think, something you'll find varied and hopefully interesting. And I want to encourage everyone, whether you're involved in photography or not, to take time and look around you. Sometimes you encounter the unexpected. And that's what I always look for, things that are not in my daily life. So I'm going to screen share, and we are going to have an eye-opening experience. You will recall this image previously, and you will see it again. This is the face of Luna Park. This is an amusement park dating back to the beginning of the last century on the other side of the uh, harbor from Sydney, Australia. So let's keep our eyes wide open. And as I like to say, what is visually in sight may give you insight. This is what caught my eye and why. So for eye-opening experiences, you can get more out of life by paying attention, being visually aware of what's around you and uh, see things you might not have seen before. So keep your eyes wide open and become a focused pupil. However, this is not an academic lesson. So you might become a pupil, but of a different type. As an artist and photographer, this is a personal visual record of my experiences to share with you. So enjoy. And um, I shoot as I encounter on the go. I don't take a tripod usually, and I'm moving from place to place quickly. So I carry a Canon 5D Mark II, 75 to 300 millimeter lens, and it allows me to get most every subject. So let's explore architecture, wildlife, and botanicals. We'll start with architecture. And this happens to be an image inside a unique hotel in Darwin on the North Shore of Australia. And in another area of Australia is the Sydney Opera House. Now, this building has become iconic, a symbol of Australia and Sydney. It was designed by the architect Jorn Utzen. In 1973, it was built and these iconic sails are fascinating, not only because they're unique for architecture, but the way they're constructed. This is right on the water, on the harbor. And as you move around it, you get very different perspectives. And under certain lighting conditions, you can see texture. 
it caught my eye because I thought it was just all white. Because when you're a distance, you don't really notice the details. And then I did a little research and I found that the tiles were different colors, two different colors, beige and white, intentional, so that they, they would be easier to focus on and wouldn't reflect so much light. It is a wonderful place to visit. And if you ever have the opportunity to see an opera there, it is wonderful. Now this structure is on the other side of the continent of Australia. This is in Perth on the Indian Ocean and it is the visitor information booth. And what caught my eye was its unique, rather organic form, very soft and welcoming. It just kind of brought you into the information booth. Also in Perth is the Perth Arena. Of course, it is a sports arena and it has interesting geometric angles and formations from every angle. Now, if you think that's unusual, go to Melbourne. Melbourne's on the southeast area of Australia. This is in Federation Square. It's a cultural arts center. And the building is unusual. You'll notice these plates, the building sheathed in plates of different colors and shapes. And there are wonderful artistic performances there and exhibitions and arts um, boutique um, galleries. Here is a very different experience. This you would not know from this angle, but you are looking at a crocodile. This is the Crocodile Hotel. And uh, I had the pleasure of actually staying there. It is in Kakadu National Park, which is operated under the original Aboriginal people's domain. It was constructed in 1998 after the success of the movie Crocodile Dundee, which I saw in Australia, in the center of Australia, um, the year that it opened, which was quite an experience, 1986. Now this building is the Criterion Hotel. It dates back to the early part of the tw uh, 20th century and it's Art Deco in a wonderful hotel that is still functioning and very high quality. More, much more contemporary in Adelaide, Australia, is the, content, uh, the convention center, which draws people from all over the continent and as well as Asia. This is the Toda Todachi Temple in Nara, Japan. It is a World Heritage Site. It's the world's largest wooden building. And you can see the size of this by looking at the size of the people. This was quite an experience. Perfectly maintained. Notice the golden horns on the roof. This is also in Japan. It is an entry kiosk to one of their historic sites. And I love the uplifting roof. It was so welcoming and bright colored. And it was particularly welcome that day because of the rain. Very different 
is this. This is the Brass Monkey Hotel, dating from the 1800s in Perth, West Australia. And a similar form. Yes, this is the Gay Head Lighthouse on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Now, I saw a, uh, uh, a historic documentary on how they moved this whole lighthouse several years ago away from the cliff edge. It had been there since the early 1800s and it, it was the, the cliff edge was wearing away. So it is now safe and wonderful to look at. Very different. This lighthouse is not only yellow, it's in Reykjavik, Iceland. And what caught my eye was the way it stood out against the gray background, the mist on the hills. And here in Tokyo, Japan, is the Tokyo Tower. Yes, it was modeled on the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and it is a key site in Tokyo, even at night. What I noticed was its bright red color seemed to be picked up by all the little red lights on all the buildings around the city. So if you look closely, you'll see these little red dots. Very different tower in Kyoto, Kyoto, Japan, the Kyoto Tower. And here is the Luna Park Tower, one of two in that amusement park, dating back, as I said earlier, to the early part of the 20th century. Now this is the Eureka Sky Deck. It was built in 2006, and I believe until recently is the tallest building uh, in Australia and the second tallest building south of the equator, because now the tallest building south of the equator is in Santiago, Chile. This is a unique building and you can go to the top and look out over all the countryside. This building is one of many new buildings being constructed with contemporary feel to it. I love the way the, the curve in the building just made it much more, uh, let's say, comfortable than the hard-edged architecture that we're used to seeing. But this one really caught my eye. In Santiago, Chile, this building had a unique geometric form that I had never seen before in a building. And as you can see, it is quite remarkable. But so was this one which I know nothing about, except I saw it in Japan and it struck me as being unique in the way it was put together, kind of like a child building with blocks. And this was in Santiago, Chile also. It started small at the bottom and blossomed up to the top. So did this, known as the Mushroom Building in Tokyo, Japan. Very different is an 18th century bell tower made from volcanic rock. Yes, it is in Tocono, Chile, and is still in use. Notice the door on the low, lower part. 
It's made of cactus wood and it's held together with llama skin. Strips of llama hide. Now this may look familiar to you. This is in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And it is one of several towers where the roof is actually a depiction of a lotus blossom. Here in Guatemala, Mayan temples. Circa 350 BC to 250 AD. This is in Yaksha. This is Tikal, one of many structures. And this one is in Tikal also that I discovered as I was trekking through the jungle, all of a sudden, I couldn't believe the scale of this building. How they built it, I'll never know, but it is as tall as one of our skyscrapers. Probably, I would estimate to be about 15 stories high. Now, I mentioned the second tallest building in South America or south of the equator. Uh, this is the second tallest building in, um, in South America. It's called the Gran Torre. It is in Santiago, Chile. It is not finished yet. When I first saw this in 2006, it was still being built, but half the scale it is now. And this unusual lighthouse was on Kangaroo Island off the south coast of Australia. It caught my eye because for a lighthouse, it just had a different structure than the norm. And I liked the way the, the street lamp, when I looked back at it, was framing it. This interesting roof was on a historic um, museum in Valparaiso, Chile. It reminded me of a conquistador helmet and obviously was designed to uh, raise that memory. Of course, there's the Chrysler building in New York, which we sometimes take for granted. But if you look closely, look at all the triangular windows, not to mention the gargoyles. Of a similar character is this building, the church, the Halgrim Skirtja in Reykjavik, Iceland. And I believe that the form of these <clears throat> column, columnar um, elements are a reflection of much of the lava forms in Iceland. Now this surprised me. This is the world's tallest tower. It is two times taller than the Eiffel Tower in Paris, 2,080 feet high, opened in 2012, and where? Yes, Tokyo, Japan. It serves as a uh, uh, multiple functions, broadcast tower and viewing tower. And this is the spire on the Opera House in Melbourne, Australia. Built in 1973, it is still there and in perfect condition. As is this bridge in Launceston, Tasmania, the South Island state of Australia. This is the world's longest walking bridge. And back in Sydney, Australia, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, also known as the 
Coat Hanger Bridge. It was built between 1923 and 1932. And today you can bungee cord jump off that bridge. So I think we should put that on the list for the Westport uh, Center for Senior Activities. This is in Kyoto, Japan. It is outside the railroad station. And it struck me as just fascinating. As you walk around, you get different perspectives. And if you stand in the center, there's a halo over your head. This is a latticed gazebo in Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. And here in Reykjavik, Iceland, the Harpa Concert Hall. Glass symbolizes Iceland's basalt landscape. It was built in 2011. And the, the structure is just fascinating. Again, um, reflecting a lot of the landscape in Iceland, the ice formations and um, the lava. Here's the roof, another roof inside the building. Now here is a lot closer to home. Now at first you wonder what is that on the left side? Well, it's a reflection of the building on the right. This is in Providence, Rhode Island. And I thought that was fascinating because we very often pass by these reflections and don't even notice them. But here it stands in contrast to the area that doesn't have the reflection. And look at the little windows on the far left on the vertical brown area. They almost look like draperies inside the building. Here is a very unusual building. This is a museum in Tokyo, Japan, but it is covered with a unique art form. These are all letter forms. Los Angeles Airport. I believe it's still there. And here was a wonderful experience. This is the Bangkok, Thailand Airport. It may not look that interesting from outside, but inside, it was remarkable. And this is the exit from your aircraft in Bangkok. The lights change constantly, different colors. Now, I know many of you don't recognize this, but this is the Levitt Pavilion in Westport. And if you think these are wonderful lights, there's the Levitt at night during a performance, which I highly recommend to everyone. This is a wonderful cultural gem. Now this happens to be stairs in the Kyoto um, train terminal and they change lights all the time, uh, even um, in sync to music periodically. So if you stand in front of this stairway, which is um, about three stories high, <laughs> you see the lights changing all the time. It's all driven by computer. And here in Bethesda, Maryland, you have night lights on staircase too. And here 
in El Salvador, Central America, a new building with lights around a curving structure that change constantly. So right now it's red. In three minutes, it'll be blue and then green. And who knows what other color? I didn't stand there that long. Now, this will give you a real lift. This is a funicular up to some very colorful buildings in Valparaiso, Chile. On the far right, you can see the funicular and this community is brightly colored and is now home to artists. But this is not a place I think you would want to live right now. This happens to be the Solola Cemetery in Guatemala. It's a Mayan tradition to honor the dead by using living colors and places of peace. Yes, you can walk all through this village, but I prefer this in Sicily. Italy, hill town buildings that have a visual interest that's captivating. It varies, but there's a similarity to it. Here it is from a distance. There's a charm and interest that constantly engages people. It certainly did with me. And then, also in Sicily, the Valley of the Temples, Agrigento. These are Greek temples from around 400 BCE and in very good condition considering how long they've been here. And you can walk in and walk around and just view this ancient, wonderful architecture. Now here are different pediments, but this is in Sicily also. These windmills are involved in producing salt. The windmills churn the water and heat it and dissolve the salt. And I found the structures very interesting especially here against a blue sky, you've got red, white, and blue, but you're not in America. Here's the salt. And I found a trip to this location worth its salt. But here in another area of Italy are plastic covered crop farming and solar panels in the distance. I didn't know what they were at first, but on closer look, there they were. They are converting to solar energy too. Now, in Chile, in Northern Chile, in the Atacama Desert, the highest desert in the world, are the remains of the ancient Pucara people. This is a fortress for its early in Chile's earliest inhabitants, 1000 to 1430 AD. And also in the Atacama Desert, a tribute, a memorial to those killed in the coup under their dictator Pinochet, 1973 to 1981. And this also in the Atacama Desert is the San Pedro Church. It was built in the 1500s and the dog in the doorway is still enjoying it, but I don't think he's been there quite as long as the church. But here you see the gate is also made of cactus wood and it is held together with llama. Yeah, llama hide. 
now we are in a totally different world. And I put this into this presentation because all of a sudden I remembered what I had seen many years ago. This is Coolidge, Arizona. This is known as the Costa Grande Runes National Monument. This is a structure made by the Hohokam people of the classic period of 1150 to 145 common era. It's adobe and it's very interesting to walk around this rather sinuous form. But so is this. This is in Honduras, South Central America. This is part of a Copan Mayan structure. It is a mountain um, considered to be an ancestor figure and was viewed through this portal. Note the curved, the carved figures. And this is in Peru. It caught my eye because these stones are huge. They weigh uh, 2,500 pounds, some of them. And the stonework is fit together so perfectly is not known how they really did this. This is Saskayuama, and it is near Cuzco in Peru. But also in Peru, a more famous site, yes, Machu Picchu, looking through a portal at another ancestor mountain. I got there very early in the morning, around 6.30, and there were no people and I found it surreal, but so was this. This is in Myanmar, formerly Burma, not a place you wanna to go to today because of the military junta that has taken over what looked like it was going to be a very different uh, government. Um, this is Mount Popa with gold covered Buddhist monasteries. And I photographed it through this wreath of growth that was just along the road. But more closely, you can see, how did they build this way up there? There is a staircase and I did climb about three quarters up. And then I ran out of breath. <laughs> Also in Myanmar, the Shwedagon Pagoda in Yangon, the capital. This is one of the most phenomenal visual experiences anyone could ever have. I framed it with this woodwork that had been made into a fret, fretwork in another building. Also impressive in another area of Myanmar, Nayong U is the Suizagan pagoda, all coated in gold. Now, many people don't know, but Myanmar has many gold mines and they cover all their Buddhist temples with gold, except the very old ones that may have been stripped of the gold. This is Bagan, dated 1100 to 1200 uh, AD. These temples are remarkable. There are 1200 of them on a plain along a river. And here is a 1940 Lutheran church in Akiuri, Iceland, lit up every night and it is yellow. 
but I love the angularity of it and the simple structure. Very different also is this contemporary church in Reykjavik, Iceland, that I might add had a wonderful gallery with local artists exhibiting very interesting work. But far from there is a black church standing out in a vacuous landscape. Yes, in Iceland, something very surreal about this experience. There was mist everywhere and the mountains were just gray. And then there was this green area around this church and it just seemed like another world until I saw this. This is also Iceland, but it is Leif Erikson's house. 1000 AD, Eric the Red, because he had red hair and a red beard, was the first settlement in Greenland. He formed that first settlement. This was his original home in Akiuri, Iceland. Akiuri is the northernmost town in Iceland. And I went into this house. And let me tell you, it was comforting. <laughs> also, uh, a traditional Nordic house, also in Iceland. But this one is not, even though it has a thatched roof. It is in Goyama, uh, Gokayama, Japan with grass thatched roofs. We were there with snow all around, just like we will be getting tonight here in Connecticut. And for those of you who may have been in Stratford, Connecticut at the Booth Memorial Park, unique buildings. This one really caught my eye. It was built in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. The family booth were focused on building unique buildings. It was like a, um, a craft. And this one had glass, um, what they, like glass um, brick windows. And I found it very unusual. Well, now, we are going to find a unique place for your mail. Yes, these are mailboxes. And they're made from recycled equipment. This is on Kangaroo Island in a little village where people believed in preserving the environment, not polluting it, and recycling anything you could recycle. So on the far left, the little green thing that looks like an open mouth with two eyes is actually a gas can. Now we're going to look at some wildlife. I would, if we were meeting in person, ask you if you knew what this was. When I saw it, I thought, oh, this has got to be a cemetery. But surprise, it is not. This is in the Kakadu National Park in Australia. It is a very remote area. These are magnetic termite mounds. Yeah, magnetic. Because these termites know north from south. And they build these to face north and south. But this termite mound in the same area is called a cathedral termite mound. And it is large and ancient. And to show you how big this is, there's my wife, Judy. Yes, it's big. 
but the little guys who make it are there too. And I didn't know they were red and green. Now, if you look closely at the bottom of the image, to the right of the green tree is another termite mound. This is a gray termite mound in Western Australia, in a very remote area. This termite mound is not a mound, it's in a tree. But these are not termites. These are bats on a tree in Belize, Central America. However, these green ant nests are all over northeastern Australia in the outback. And when they lose their um, leaves, as you can see, the ants there looks like a basket. So I guess those ants went to hell in a basket. I was taking a walk last year in my neighborhood and I saw this and I wonder what are all those fluffy white things? So I went up close and they were spider webs catching water, little drops of water from the dew. And outside my house last year, yeah, a spider web. But I was fascinated with the structure. And this, this spider is not one you want to bump into. This is a red crescent poison spider in a very remote region of the world in an area called Cooper Pedy in South Australia. This is where they mine opals and people live underground in caves that they burrow into in the same way they burrow tunnels to hunt for, yeah, for the gems. How do you like this one? This tarantula I photographed in Cambodia. It's as big as your hand. And this locust is in the Galapagos Islands, hundreds of miles off the coast of Ecuador in the Pacific Ocean. And here, right in Connecticut, you have a woolly bear caterpillar. Apparently, it yields the Isabella tiger moth. Now I'm going to show you a variety of butterflies from the family Lepidoptera. And you'll recognize them. How delicate they are. They stand on these little legs. and a monarch on a thistle. Well, this is not a butterfly, but I'm so fascinated with the color relationship of the yellow to the pinkish purple of the thistle. Now here are some dragonflies. and a damselfly on a water lily. That's the blossom of a water lily before it opens. And a spotted ladybug. How about this for dinner? A slug. Yeah, about six inches long in the Galapagos Islands. Or a snail. 
on Martha's Vineyard. Here's another shell game. These turtle, turtles are in Westchester. And a Galapagos tortoise. And Lonesome George, a Galapagos tortoise that died in 2012 at 102 years old. He has become the symbol of ecology for the Galapagos Islands. Chew on that for a bit. Now we're in the Torres del Paine National Park in Chile, South America. And yes, this is an armadillo. Very friendly. But I didn't know they had hair. I thought they just had a shell or scales. Now this monkey, I didn't want to get near. He was vicious, collecting garbage and food wherever he could. Yes, on that Mount Popa in Myanmar. And another monkey in Angkor Wat, Cambodia at sunset. Now I'm gonna show you some Sally Lightfoot crabs that populate the Galapagos Islands and they change color as they age. This is an immature. It blends in with the lava background and is less visible than this, a teenager that is starting to develop color. And when they're mature, they're bright colors, fascinating. And they stand out as adults against the lava. Now this is a pencil sea urchin, also in the Galapagos Islands. And this is a green sea urchin. But this is a sea anemone that I caught as I was walking by on a beach in Oregon, up in the Northwest. But here we have a sand dollar. Yep, on green sand. Look closely at the sand. There are crystals of green sand. That is in the Galapagos Islands too. But a cluster of mussels in Patagonia, southern Chile, caught my eye because I had never seen so many grouped together quite like that. Here in Connecticut, we see one here or there on the beach. And then this, in a totally different area of the world, this is a skink, yes, S-K-I-N-K, -K, a skink in Nambung, West Australia. They can regrow their tails and they live in a vacuous sand area. This lizard is camouflaged beautifully better than this one. This one is in a sand flat in Atacama Desert, Chile. I could barely see it. And this is the Punta Suarez Marine Iguana on the uh, Punta Suarez Island. It was different than any of the iguanas I had seen on all the islands. This one was brightly colored. The others were not. But here are a variety of iguanas. This one actually in the Caribbean. 
And this one, yeah, this looks like, well, maybe Godzilla. This is in the Galapagos Islands. As is this on a different island. They change colors as they uh, adjust to their environment. And this one was on a totally different island than the previous one. This one was on, this one was on an island full of dark or black lava. So it melded in. This one was on more of a sand island. Look at the texture. Not to mention the smile. Pucker up. Look at those nostrils. That's nothing to sneeze at. And then I, on one of the islands, I saw this iguana chewing on a cactus. And I wondered how they could do that because of the prickers, all the, yeah, prickers on the cacti. And then I saw this and I realized they don't all survive. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is the end of an iguana. But look at the shape of the teeth. Now, can you see this? Very well camouflaged. This is a saltwater crocodile in the Kakadu, Northeast Australia. Very dangerous animal. And here's why. They come at their prey very silently and then wham, they can jump 20 feet out of the water. Immense. You don't want to get caught by one of these. He doesn't care. He's just snoozing. Yeah, it's a New Zealand fur seal on Kangaroo Island in Australia. Notice how he melds into the verdure. Here's another one coming out of rest. He looked at me like, what, are you taking my picture? I said, yeah, and he decided to leave. So I said, okay hell with you, I'll go look at some sea lions in the Galapagos. You can get up very close, but you don't touch them. And this is what is known as a little pup, a sea lion pup. Dolphins in Patagonia, in the fjords, southern uh, Chile. And dolphins are found in the Southern Ocean off the south coast of Australia. Now, you will not find this in North America. This is a marsupial known as an echidna. It looks like a hedgehog or a whatever, but it is a very well protected animal that lives in, yes, Australia. And then you have a wombat. Please record a message. Excuse me. Pardon that interruption. Wombats are marsupials. They're about the size of a small dog and they burrow and live in Tasmania. And here you have a uh, close-up. I had one hell of a time getting this photo. Every time I approached it, he would turn around. So after about 15 minutes, I said, this is my last chance and I got him. They feed on grasses, and they also feed on leeches, which you got to be careful of because they can 
climb up your leg. Now this is, hold just a moment. I'm sorry about that interference. Um, this you do not want to get close to. This is, yes, the Tasmanian devil. It is as big as a uh, medium-sized dog, and it has the strongest jaws in the animal kingdom. They fight among themselves, and they tear food apart, usually roadkill. And this animal almost became extinct a few years ago because as they were fighting, they were, they were passing on a unique cancer in their saliva. And if they fought with one another, the cancer would be spread. So the park rangers in Tasmania transferred the healthy ones to an island for safekeeping, and they're making a comeback. Now, a very different animal, also on Kangaroo Island, which is a national preserve off the south coast of the continent, is a place where koalas are found. And he's giving me a look of scrutiny because he knows I'm going to shoot him with my camera. Ah, when he learns that, he goes, ah, so you're not gonna shoot me with a gun? Okay. Another one is feeding. They only feed on one or two varieties of eucalyptus trees. And I heard um, through some news about a year ago, these um, particular koalas on Kangaroo Island were decimating the trees so much that they had to be eliminated. Had the, they had to be reduced in the, in the number of koalas in the park area. A very different marsupial. This is a Bennett wallaby. There are different types of wallabies, which are like little kangaroos. And they behave like kangaroos. They hop on their, line, their legs. They carry their little ones in pouches on their chest. And they're shy. And this one is in a jungle in Tasmania. While I was hiking in a very remote area, I noticed them. And this is a different type of wallaby. This is a kangaroo island wallaby, and it is very shy, but suspicious too. Now these were, I would say, a happy accident that I found them. This is in the Atacama Desert, very high up, about 15, no, about uh, 10,000 feet. These are Atacama Desert foxes. And I just happened to catch them coming out of a cave in a geyser field. And also this, yes, it's a poor photograph, but I'm lucky to have gotten it. If I questioned all of you, I doubt anyone would know what that animal was because I didn't know, and the park ranger that I was with didn't know. So I researched it, and it's known as a viscacha. Yes, viscacha. They only live in the desert. They only live in the Atacama Desert in Chile. There's a variety that live in the north and in the south of the desert. They look kind of like rabbits, but they're not. They have ears that stick up and a very broad tail that you don't see in this image, but it looks almost 
like a, um, well, it's a flat, wide tail. And of course, there's the Eastern gray squail, gray squirrel. <laughs> and how about another one? Chew on that for a while. This is a llama up close, chewing on some, yeah, uh, greens. And um, I took a picture of this and I sent it to my grandchild, my granddaughters some years ago. And um, I entitled it Como Se Llama because in South America, they say llama, not llama. Como se llama? This is a bad hair day. An alpaca in Peru. And this is a guanaco, a cameloid that lives in uh, Chile in the Torres del Paine National Park. They live in heights. You won't find them in lowlands. And they look different than other cameloids. Here's one. There they are. But this is not a guanaco. It looks similar, but it is a vicuña. Vicuñas are now protected. They were hunted for a long time for their, for their fur. It's the softest fur in the animal kingdom. Now, oh, cuddle that. Now I'm gonna show you a bird that's going to be nesting in a very unusual spot. There. How's that for a bad hair day? <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a Patagonian condor that I photographed in the fjords in Southern Chile. And this is a Atacama coot. Yeah, I'd never heard of a coot, but that's a coot. Now, this is a frigate bird. Frigate birds are found in the Galapagos Islands and the males have red throats. And you'll see what happens to their red throats. As you get closer to them, they blow them up to attract the female. And a lot of the females probably think they're full of themselves. They're all puffed up. But they are big. Now these are swallowtail gulls, also in the Galapagos Islands. And the thing that's so fascinating about them visually is the red circle around their eyes that go perfectly with their red feet. Here's looking at you, kid. Now in the wilds of Western Australia, I was really surprised to find peacocks. And these are not natural to Australia. They escaped from some private collection and they have really done very well out in the outback. And that's the back of this. See, here you see, but when he raises his fan tail like that around back, you see this. Here is a blue-footed booby. 
This is in the Galapagos, famous bird. And there are different types of boobies. And a booby is named booby because uh, Spanish um, pirates first settled or landed in the islands. And because the animals here have no fear, these pirates and hunters could go up and kill them without any problem at all. So they called them stupid. And the, and the term they used in Spanish was booby. They're boobies, they're stupids. Now you're up close to a blue-footed booby foot. And this guy is a red-footed booby on different islands, different birds. Look at his beak. Yeah, right on. And then there is the Nathka booby. They don't have colorful feet. But they have big bills and they look you straight in the eye. Yep, right up close. Now here is a flamingo. Yes, there are flamingos, three types that breed and live in Chile and in Galapagos Islands. These are in the Galapagos. I could not understand how they could stand on such thin legs, very well balanced. And this is a blue heron on an island off the southeast coast of Australia called Phillip Island. Here's looking at you, kid. This is an emu in Tasmania. And these are pelicans. That's some beak, huh? This is a black swan, only found in Western Australia. Now, I don't know if that's a white mustache that he's growing or something else, but it caught my eye. These are cormorants off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Cormorants. And all the white that you see there is guano. Yes, droppings. These are Cape Barren geese on Phillip Island, Australia. They fly in all the time, wherever you are, they just fly in and land. Here's a preening pigeon. And a regular pigeon right here on Silver Sand State Park. Look at the colors. Now I'd never seen this bird before. It's known as a caracara. It's in the Torres del Paine National Park in Chile. It is related to the hawks, like this one. Also, this one happens to be in Tasmania. And this is a sulfur crested cockatoo on the east coast of Australia at sunset. Now these are cuddling galahs. Yeah, they're called galahs. They're an Australian type of parrot. They have a harsh call. And apparently women who have harsh voices in Australia are often called galahs. So in a restaurant, if a woman is calling or talking very harshly, the people at the next table will say, she's a galah. This is a rainbow lorikeet in Northeast Australia in a very remote area of the outback. And this is one of two types of macaws that I saw in Costa Rica.
Now I'm going to take you on a journey and I'll try to move quickly because I know we're over an hour to some botanicals. These that I'm showing you now are Banksias. Banksias are indigenous to Australia. They only grow there. And there are different varieties all over the continent. Some grow in small trees and some in bushes. They are very interesting because you think they're spiky and, and sticky. Uh, they'll stick you, but they're not. Those are petals. Those are like, like petals on a flower. And when these petals dry up, this is what it looks like. And these areas open up and yeah, the, the seeds pop out of these little openings. And then I saw another one with lots of openings, different varieties have different types of pods within uh, the pod itself. And then I saw this one that reminded me of a face, two of the holes where the where the uh, seeds had popped out are the eyes. Then there's one that hasn't popped out, that's the nose. And what's coming out of the mouth is a dried leaf. This is a strangler, a strangler uh, fig. Strangler figs are found in different parts of the world. And this happens to be in the outback of Australia. And I found them in Cambodia also. Here in Cambodia is a very famous uh, opening to an ancient building in Angkor Wat. These strangler figs over years and years or centuries even can completely cover anything. Now this is inside a poppy blossom a poppy. And this is a globe hakea in Australia, two varieties, this one and this one. They do not grow anywhere else. Neither do these. This is a mangles kangaroo paw. It is a flower that grows only in the Perth area of Western Australia. It is the town or city's flower. And there are other types of kangaroo paws. This one is the red kangaroo paw. And here in Tasmania, in an area that is very remote, these are white lichen. Is a very damp area, very remote. And there, ferns turn color in the winter. And on the Gordon River, which is in the southwest of Tasmania, the most remote area you could ever imagine, it is so still on this river that everything is mirrored. Now this is known as the yellow billabong, and it is in the Kakadu National Park, Northeastern Australia. These are lotus plants. And you'll notice the lotus pod in the center of the blossom is yellow. And when the flower dries, this is what you get. And those seeds, pop out and create a fascinating structure. Those seeds are used medicinally throughout South Asia. This is mango growing in an area of Northwestern, on the Northwestern coast of Australia, known as Kananura. And this is a lufa, yeah the kind you would get in a health food store maybe for rubbing yourself in the shower for 
you know, getting rid of dried skin. This is a loofah. It's growing in Costa Rica. And this is cacao, chocolate pods in Guatemala. They grow off the trunk of the cacao tree. And this is what the seeds look like inside before they're ground up to make chocolate. These are coffee beans, also Guatemala. And when they ripen, they turn red. And that's when they're harvested. <clears throat> now, I would like to take a moment and find out how many of you really know what this blossom or blossoms are. And I can guarantee you 99% would not know. These are macadamia flowers. Yes, in Guatemala. And this is a macadamia nut growing on a tree. And here they are before they are opened and served to you as macadamia nuts or ground and used for the um, for cosmetics. This fascinated me. It is kelp. In on the south coast of Australia, as I was hiking along a beach, um, I saw these big straps of of what I thought were seaweed of some kind, and they are. Those tubes are are like your garden hose. They wash up from the Southern Ocean. And some look like, uh, <laughs> to me, it looked like an anchor. And then maybe that's the function that it served. This is an Amazonian water platter. I photographed in Adelaide, Southwest Australia. They bloom, but only at night or when it gets so cloudy, the sun doesn't shine on them. And their blossoms start to look like this as they open up. And that is an Amazonian water platter flower. It is about 10 to 12 inches wide. It's magnificent. And these are water lilies photographed at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. Some of my favorite flowers. Now this is the lace hydrangea and they're right here in Connecticut. And I just love them. And they caught my eye because they're so different. This is a Chinese hibiscus. I found this in Tasmania. Whoops. This is a crimson eyed rose mallow growing in the wild on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. And this unusual flower or blossom is a heliconia that grow in the tropics in Costa Rica. This is opuntia or prickly pear in the Galapagos Islands where it's very um, prevalent and a night blooming cactus in the Atacama Desert in Chile. A calla lily in Western, actually Southwestern Australia. And Frajapani tree blossom in Western Australia. They have the most magnificent aroma. Just, you can't get enough of them. They smell so good. This is an almond tree blossom. 
and a straw flower with a bee in Perth, West Australia. Inside a water lily at the New York Botanical Gardens. I thought that was a pearl in the center, but I don't think it is. Now I was really surprised to find the real name for this succulent that I encountered on Kangaroo Island off the south coast of Australia was known and is known as pig's nose. Yeah, pig's nose. Because I researched out the closed flower of this plant resembles a pig's face. This I found unexpectedly in a very remote area of the outback in an area called Litchfield of all places, Australia. It is called Sticky Korajong, Sticky Korajong. And it grows on um, the branches of the tree from which it comes. No leaves, just on the branches. These are bottle brush in Western Australia. This is called Pride of Madeira. I photographed this in Sydney, Australia, along with this, sisal, a type of agave. Um, it's about um, 12 to 15 feet high. I'd never seen anything quite like it. And then opuntia. Yes, cacti on the Galapagos Islands. From island to island, they're different. You don't want to bump up against these. That's why. I'm sorry, I'm being a stickler for detail. This is a spiked aloe, Kings Park, Perth, Australia, and a unique Australian flower called Grevillea. This is oak leaf dryandra, also an Australian flower, dryandra. And then on the Galapagos Islands, I saw this one day. I said, my God, that is so golden. What, what kind of uh, shrub is that? And I went up close and I found out it wasn't the shrub. It's a golden fungus that completely covers the stems on one island in the Galapagos. Now this is spinifex, very sharp grass. You do not want to step on it. And how the Aboriginal peoples managed to get across these flats of spinifex, I'll never know. But they are like, like pins and needles, literally. And on Kangaroo Island, they grow a lot of rapeseed. Now, I don't know how many of you know, rapeseed is actually where canola oil comes from. And during World War II, Canada grew a lot of rapeseed for its oil, which was used as a lubricant in machinery. Well, on Kangaroo Island in Australia, they grow a lot and you can get canola oil from this. And with that, we bid farewell, farewell with the tree silhouette in a sunset in Mandalay, Myanmar. My shadows wave goodbye. And it's time to exit. So keep your eyes wide open. Remember to look in order to see. You may discover something new. So. Very good, David. Um, we are not going to be offering bungee cord jumping off the roof here, by the way. At the You're same not. Time. 
No. I am. Well, we might have to get a new waiver then. I don't know. So, I am uh, truly surprised. Very good. Uh, let's see if anybody has any questions. Uh, if you just want to unmute yourself and raise your hand, we could go by that. And then my favorite pictures were probably the dragonflies. Those are really unique. Oh, I'm glad you like those. Uh, uh, yes, John, hold up. You got to unmute John. John can unmute. unmute himself. We can't it, talk to mutants. Mutants <laughs> don't reply. Uh, he's working on it. One of these buttons. One of these buttons. Some worked. Yes. Okay. Do you John. hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, we can hear you, John. Hey, David, your yes. presentation was somewhere between unbelievable and even better than that. Well, I loved you. it. Thank you very, very much. Well, I am very flattered, and that makes it worth the effort I put into this. Um, when these things are projected on Zoom, the clarity and um, you know um, yeah. it isn't always what you would get if you were seeing it in a gallery or um, on the lobby wall at the Westport uh, Center for Senior Activities. Um, but um, thank you for your appreciation, John. Yeah. Um, I uh, see my my. Uh, friends from all over. If, uh, Joan, did you have a question? Joni. I just had to thank you very much, Dave. We loved it. Oh, some of these were not taken in Torrington, Connecticut. <laughs> but many were taken in Galapagos. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, John, for John to say that, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice compliment coming well, from him. I'm very pleased. I, I hope you all enjoyed it. Is that my cousin, Doug? Wow. In NYC. <laughs> Thank Great. you so much, David. Thank you. I'm glad you joined in. And I'm glad I see my, my Wiseman Camera Club friends, Sal and Jean-Pierre. And there is Bernie, Bernie Perry. Thank you so much. Fascinating presentation. Thank you, Joanne. Um, next week, we'll see how it goes. It's going to be partially in person, I'm told. So I will be at uh, the center and we will do it also on Zoom. So you'll be able to see it on Zoom too. And uh, next we'll, week- We'll cross our fingers on that. We'll see we're how we'll cross our fingers. <laughs> I, I have my fingers crossed that we can actually pull it off. And um, uh, next week is going to be very different. It's going to be called Let's Face It. It's based on something I have been following for uh, quite a number of years. And some of you may have been exposed in 2010. I did an exhibition in Fairfield called Facebook 2010. And it's all about faces. Faces I have observed in real people and in animals and in man-made objects and in natural formations in geological subjects, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I've put together a presentation that will um, just be called Let's Face It. And I think you'll be surprised to see things that you have seen, but maybe not remembered. And then the last performance, <laughs> week after next, will be things that made me smile. Things I've photographed as I've gone through life that have made me kind of chuckle or, wow, that's kind of humorous. And that'll give you a lift during this pandemic period. So that's what's to come. And um, I want to thank uh, Jason for his technological help to make this happen. And I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. And uh, I know we've gone uh, a bit over the time that we normally would plan to do, but you're still here. So for those of you who suffered the longest, thank you. Thank you guys, <laughs> have a great weekend. Um, thank you. Get your snow shovels out. Thank, thank you, you David, it was quite a treat.